Hello everyone, I'm delighted to welcome you all this afternoon to what I'm sure is going to be a really useful webinar. Um, just to say that if any questions come up afterwards, um, if you think of anything that you wish you'd asked or um, anything that you want to talk through, then please do get in touch with us um, on the support service at Overcome. Uh, we're available via telephone, email, instant chat, um, text message, uh, you can also Skype us or we can set up a, a Zoom call. Um, so please do get in touch. We're always happy to, to talk anything through and um, provide information and we can also check with Sarah if there's, if there's something specific that, um, that you wanted to know. Um, so I will hand over to uh, Sarah now and uh, we'll look forward to all the information that she's got to share and do please drop your um, questions into the Q&A and the chat and I'll read them out for Sarah to answer. Thanks. Thanks Anna and Alice. Hello everyone, I'm just going to share my screen and then we'll get into the presentation. Is that coming up Alice? Yes, yeah, there you go. Okay, let me just get into presentation mode. Um, there we go. Okay, so good afternoon everyone. Um, it's going to be a presentation just for the next half hour or so with some, with some questions afterwards on sleep health and strategies for aiding good sleep. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about sleep to begin with and the background behind sleep. Um, whilst it's important that we focus on some strategies for good sleep, um, I want to just give you a little bit of background as to what sleep is and, and how, we, how we fall asleep because um, that will add some context into why we employ some of the strategies that we do and, and how they might work. So really to think about sleep in a nutshell, it's, it's an impact factor on life, it supports life. Um, there is no physiological system in the body that isn't significantly impaired by good sleep or uh, sorry, impaired by poor sleep or enhanced by good sleep. So sleep impacts on our mental health, our cognition, our ability to process information and, and to consolidate things that we might have learned and experienced throughout the day. It impacts on our physical health and well-being. So our ability to to exercise to to feel well during the day and um, to continue with our daily activities and also quite critically at the moment um, and also for, for those going through through treatment it impacts significantly on our immune system so the the premise of sleep is that it's it's supporting life not just from a physical um, point of view in terms of your health and well-being but but also on our mental health as well and, um, and critically on our immune system. So in terms of sleep having an impact factor on our, on our physical and mental wellness, if you like, small changes can have a large cumulative effect. So if you're having small changes affecting your sleep in a bad way, that's gonna have a large effect over a period of time. But conversely, if you, if you make some small changes with some strategies that we'll learn about today, actually they can have quite a large effect on your ability to have good sleep. So the good news is that even if you're experiencing poor sleep, it often doesn't need some monumental change that you have to make around your sleep to, to experience good sleep again. It means that you can, you can have some small changes that are gonna help you in quite a fairly major way. So in terms of what sleep is, it's really, it's not owned by any discipline. It's not owned by medicine. It's not owned by psychology. There's a multiple, um, multitude of domains that sleep falls into and and that kind of gives you an indication into its com in, in, of its complexity we don't really know the exact mechanisms behind sleep or what it is but the knowledge around sleep is increasing and there is a certain amount of, of good knowledge around sleep um, but the exact mechanisms for it and, and why we need it to such re regularity and why it's such a, an insistent and important physiological biological function um, is still a little bit of a mystery to us. We know that essentially it's a balance mechanism, so the, the homeostatic state of the body, the, the balance of the physiology of the human body is intrinsically linked to getting good sleep. And that in turn is, in, is linked to something called the, the light-dark cycle, which we'll, we'll come on to in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. But that 24-hour rhythm of light and dark is intrinsically linked to your sleep. We know that everyone does it, um, yet it's entirely individualised and one person's sleep pattern um, and need is different to the next person's. We also know that it's linked to your immune system, like we said before, 
um, and the fact that it's basically serves as, as a bit of a, a rest for the brain, the, a, a break from the wear and tear of wakefulness, if you like. But that's a little bit misleading because it suggests that when you're asleep, your, your brain is in a passive state. It, it very much isn't, and, and we'll come to that in a little while. Um, so while your body might be in a, in a state of unconsciousness, your brain is actually very active when you're asleep. We know that without it, we would die for sure. As a human species, we need to sleep. Um, there is no accident that uh, torture, sleep deprivation is a torture technique. Um, as, as a human species, we need sleep. And over a period of time without it, we would unfortunately, we would unfortunately die. Um, the good news is, though, it's free. It's, a, it's the ultimate performance enhancer. Um, there is nothing better than getting good sleep for enhancing your physical and mental performance, whether that's just getting through the chores of daily life or whether it's performing on a world stage if you're an athlete or whether it's performing at work on a particular piece of a project or, or a competition or whatever it might be. Sleep will impact on your ability to deliver performance relative to what, what that may be. It's also kind of known as, as the, the not so secret secret weapon in the sense that everybody sleeps, we all do it, but very few people actually pay attention to their sleep and, and how making some small changes can, can give them good sleep and, and the benefits they'll get from that. So, uh, you know, it's available to you, it's, it's right in front of you, the effects that it would have, um, but it's kind of like a, a bit of a, a secret as to the benefits that it might have in the terms of people don't access it. Um, don't access good sleep as often as they might. So what are the causes of sleep? Just, just briefly on this, not, not too much science to say on afternoon after lunchtime when we might be a little bit sleepy. Um, essentially there's two physiological causes of sleep. Um, the first being the, the 24 hour circadian rhythm. So your sleep wake cycle, which aligns to the light dark cycle that I mentioned in the previous slide. And what this alludes to is the fact that you have this intrinsic rhythm, your circadian rhythm, the same as the need to eat, to reproduce. The sleep is, is that intrinsic need within all of us linked to our circadian daily 24 hour rhythm. So on the right there, you've got a, a, a graph of 24 hours, midnight to midnight. And you'll see there the dark blue line, the circadian rhythm. It's at midnight, the urge to sleep dips off and then you wake up in the morning and then there's a slight rise after lunch where the urge to sleep um, is a little bit higher again. That's known as, as the, the diurnal dip in the afternoon, the, the post-lunch dip. Um, and that's linked to your body temperature. It also has a circadian rhythm. And, and when that dips, the urge to sleep is, is heightened somewhat. And then the urge to sleep tails off and then in the evening again, it rises. Now that's linked to, to the light and dark cycle and a hormone called melatonin, which is essentially the Dracula hormone. It, it only comes out at night. And um, when the sunlight goes through your eye, through your retina, deep into your brain, into something called the suprachiasmic nucleus, which is the most technical term you'll hear this afternoon. So the light goes through, hits the SEN, and the lack of light in the evening stimulates the SEN to say, okay, there's not much light, melatonin rises, the Dracula hormone, and that's one of the reasons that uh, we feel the need to go to sleep, and that's linked to our circadian rhythm. The second aspect of sleep is something called sleep pressure. Um, now, this is linked back to what I was saying about sleep being a, a balanced mechanism, so your, your body's need to be in, in homeostasis, in, in balance, um, and it's a, a flip-flop switch um, which happens almost not automatically, but you, you feel when you go to sleep, you don't necessarily know at that point at which you fall asleep. And that's linked to something called sleep pressure. Now, again, on the graph, you can see you've got a 24 hour cycle there, 7 a.m. to 7 a.m. And the dotted blue line, ignore the yellow line, that's the circadian rhythm. So that's just there in the background to remind us that the, the circadian rhythm is, is floating along throughout the 24 hour cycle. The dotted blue line is our sleep pressure. Now that increases linearly throughout the day. And at some point um, we have to cut that off. Um, the need to sleep becomes greater and greater and greater. So you can see there at 7 a.m. quite relatively low sleep pressure. And then that builds right through up until early evening, late evening when we fall asleep. The sleep pressure then the solid blue line drops off until the point the next morning where we wake and then it builds again throughout the day. 
Now that's linked to um, several chemicals in the brain, which basically will switch on and off your sleep promoting system and your arousal system. And it's, it's known really as a, as a flip flop switch and, and you will flip flop between being awake and being asleep based on the amount of sleep pressure that you have. So the two things to remember really are the causes of sleep being your circadian rhythm and the amount of sleep pressure that you have, your, the balance mechanism within your body. Linked to that is when you're actually asleep and what happens. So most of us will have a 90 minute sleep cycle, give or take. Everybody has sleep cycles, but the actual length will be determined somewhat by your individual sleep architecture. But essentially it's a 90 minute sleep cycle. And this is made up of four sleep stages. The first three sleep stages are what's called non-rapid eye movement sleep, non-REM sleep. And this is the transition stage where you go through from being awake to asleep. You move into a deeper stage of sleep, sometimes called slow wave sleep, and that's linked to the, the brain waves that you would see if you, if you did an analysis of your sleep. You'd see some really nice, deep, slow, slow brain waves during non-REM sleep. Your body temperature drops, everything slows down, and you go into a deep stage of sleep. Towards the sort of mid to, et to end point of that sleep cycle, you'll hit what's called rapid eye movement sleep. And this is your REM type of sleep. And this is your dream sleep. So where you might have had all your memory consolidation um, in non-REM sleep, you might have had some reflection of the reception of being awake and then in the reflection stage of being asleep in non-REM sleep. You then hit what's known as a rematuration phase in your REM sleep. So all of those neural pathways um, that have been tired and worn out from being awake get an opportunity to, to remature and, and reset if you like. And essentially this is the, the 90 minute sleep cycle is, is the core of what we're talking about when we, we talk about getting good sleep cycles, good sleep strategies, because you want to maximize the amount of sleep cycles you can get throughout the night because the benefits of your non-REM sleep and your REM sleep are endless. And, and that is where you get your cognitive, you get your physical um, and your immune benefits from the different stages of sleep and the impact that each stage of sleep has on various physiological systems. So we know, <coughs> excuse me, we know what causes sleep, sleep, your circadian rhythm and your sleep pressure. And we know that sleep is based off of a 90 minute sleep cycle incorporating REM and non-REM sleep. Now how much of that do we actually need? So when we talk about good sleep health and how much we need, we're talking really on general for most people about seven to nine hours sleep. That does change from individual to individual. Some people naturally um, can operate on, on less sleep, um, but for the majority of the population, seven to nine hours um, is normal. Um, and that has to have good quality sleep, so very few disturbances. Um, how many, how often are you getting your REM, non-REM balance? It's, it's quite common to have more dream sleep towards the latter stages of the night and more non-dream sleep towards the, the, the earlier stages of the night and that's just the way that our, our physiology makes up our sleep and, and what we have evolved as a human species to do. Don't get caught up in how much of each part of sleep you're having, the important part is that you're having your sleep, cycle, sleep cycles and they're consistent because then we know that you're getting enough of each part of your sleep. So the amount of disturbances, you, it's quite common to get up one or two times in the night to go to the toilet, for example. But if you're getting up more than that, then some of the strategies we'll come on to might help with getting a little bit more consistency in the quality of your sleep. The quantity, so how long are you asleep for? How many of your of full 90 minute sleep cycles are you getting? And the key to that is just to have a consistent routine. So from the point at which you know you need to get up, say, for example, for work, then that's going to be a regular get up time that you need every morning, then work back from that and work out your bedtime to ensure that you get your, your seven to nine hours. The duration, the quantity of sleep will depend on circumstances. So obviously if you're ill, um, you know, your sleep schedule is going to be dictated by, by the need to sleep because sleep will feed your immune system. So, um, you know, you will naturally need more sleep. It's also going to be affected to a certain extent by something called your chronotype, which whether you're a morning or an evening type person, most people are somewhere in between. Um, and it does change with age as well. 
Also in terms of sleep health, we look at your regularity. So how consistent is your sleep schedule? I talked a moment there about getting up early for work on a regular basis. Most of us at the moment aren't needing to commute to the same extent that we were due to the, the, the coronavirus situation, but we, it's important that we still get a regular routine. So are you going to bed at the same time every night? Are you getting up at the same time every morning? Um, are you experiencing something called social jet lag, which is where you, you have short sleep throughout the week and then at the weekend you're making up for it um, by having a longer sleep? And that's not really going to be beneficial long term. Um, so it's important that we establish that good sleep routine throughout the week. And we'll come on to ways to do that in a second. And also the continuity of your sleep is really important. So is it, fra is it fragmented sleep? Are you really restless throughout the night? Are you continually waking up? Um, you know, we might have a situation where, where, you're, where you're being woken up, you know, for whatever reason during the night. Maybe, you know, you haven't got a really good soundproofing and you live on a busy street, you know. So there's the strategies that we can put in place to, to help minimise the fragmentation of your sleep if that's what's happening. But remember, it is normal to get up once or twice in the night. Just quickly looking at the impact of poor sleep and then coming on to some of the, the proactive things that we can do about it. So we know that sleep debt is accumulative and we know that an acute sleep debt, an acute sleep loss is actually not that big an issue. Um, so one bad night's sleep isn't going to be too much of a problem every now and again. And that's completely normal for most people. Um, it will have minimal side effects. You'll feel groggy the next day, but you can probably overcome it with some fresh air, good hydration if you can tolerate caffeine and you like drinking it then the odd cup of coffee but obviously not too much um, and then an early night and you're back into your normal routine and and carry on with good sleep for the rest of the time where it becomes a problem is when you have chronic sleep loss and that's when we can see physiological and psychological functions being affected and that's things like your cognitive ability your reaction time your ability to to tolerate physical activity um, and your mood, your responsiveness, things like that can become affected with chronic um, poor sleep. The impact on, on sleep, on poor sleep, on your performance, so on, not necessarily performing on the world stage, but performing just in daily life, is determined to a large extent by your requirement for sleep. So how much you need as an individual and, and you learning that and recognising that in yourself, um, but also your responses to poor sleep. So how do you cope with it? Um, what do you do about it? You know, how proactive are you about making some changes about that and, um, and then changing that period of poor sleep into, into good sleep and using some of the strategies we'll come on to to do that. How the, your requirement for sleep and how you cope and your responses to poor sleep are completely individualised and what works for one person won't be the same for the next. Um, but they do vary with, with gender, age, your chronotype, so whether you're a morning or an evening person, and also your, your general level of health will, will affect that to a certain extent. In terms of sleep quantity then, <clears throat> and how much you need and your responses, there are some, some self-checks that you can put in place um, just, to, just to make sure that you think, okay, yeah, I'm getting enough sleep or, or actually, no, I'm not. And we'll come on to some of the strategies that we can use if you're not getting enough sleep. So remember, it's totally individualised. Um, think about whether or not you wake up feeling refreshed. <coughs> so most people, excuse me, when you wake up, it's your alarm clock might go off or whatever. Um, you know, you'll feel a bit groggy. But if you're in a good sleep routine, um, you might find that actually you're waking up on your alarm or just before your alarm. And that's how you know you've had enough sleep because, you know, you're in that routine, you wake up and it's like, oh, it's morning, you're a bit groggy, but you very quickly can be awake. Um, consider how often you're waking during the night. Remember, like I said, it's normal to wake one or, once or twice during the night. And do, you, do you feel sleepy during the day? Is, is daytime sleepiness a real issue for you? Um, and that's not just the, the afternoon deer. Um, so this sort of time after lunch or around three o'clock, maybe where you feel a bit sleepy, that's, that's a physiological occurrence, that's normal. Um, so if you're getting that every day, don't worry, that's that's normal. But if you're feeling sleepy throughout the day, if it's 11 o'clock and in the morning and you, you can't get to that time without several cups of coffee, um, that's probably an indicator that you're not getting enough sleep. And consider the characteristics of good sleep. So do you wake up feeling refreshed and alert and able to be fully productive during your waking hours? So if you can go through some of those self-checks, 
<coughs> and feel um, that you're not getting enough sleep or that perhaps you are but not on a regular basis then there are some strategies that we can put in place to address that the first thing to do is consider what your sleep strategy is and if indeed you've got one so do you ever think about on a regular basis i need to go to bed at x time um, tonight or on a regular basis that time of night at 10 o'clock every night therefore these are the things that i need to do to ensure that at that time of night my head's on the pillow and i'm ready to sleep i am in a really good frame of mind physiological state to fall asleep i've done everything i need to do i'm in the right environment um, and i can go to sleep so some of the things that we need to consider fall under our sleep hygiene which is basically all of our behavioral and environmental factors that precede sleep and that's kind of an umbrella term for everything that we would talk about in terms of our strategy to sleep and the other thing that we'll talk about is our sleep systems our environment we'll look at sleep extension strategies which is essentially napping and we'll look at the detail around how we can use naps to to benefit um, our sleep and our, our nighttime sleep as well We'll look at some strategies for other aspects um, that might be impacting on your sleep, for example, steroids and menopause. And then we'll briefly look at some nutrition aspects as well at the end. <coughs> so optimal sleep systems. By this, I mean your bedroom, your bed, your pillow, the bedding, the mattress, every aspect of your, of your bed comes under this term of sleep system. Um, essentially, obviously it needs to be comfortable for you. It needs to be the right temperature. So by that we mean ideally ambient temperature. So not too hot, not too cold. So about 18 to 20 degrees is the recommended. Um, the bed needs to be something that keeps you in, in a neutral spine. So you're not obviously getting musculoskeletal issues linked to your sleep system in terms of giving you poor sleep, causing you pain, neck pain, for example. The common misconception is that people pile in all the pillows if you're reading or whatever which is great but then you might not need all those pillows when you go to sleep ideally one and, and not a massive thick one either um, you, you need to keep your your spine and your your head in a neutral line while you're sleeping and also seasonal and by that i mean the things like the the thickness of the sheets and the tog of the duvet so rather than having the same duvet 12 months of the year do you change that based on the season so you're not too hot and um, particularly when hot flushes and the men and menopause come into play also with your sleep system and uh, goes without saying you need a familiar environment um, you might have heard of the the first night effect if you go away for work or on holiday and you're staying in a hotel or a strange room whatever it may be self-catering whatever it may be um, that first night is always a bit odd because it's <coughs> you're sleeping in a in a strange bed um, so it will take a, a couple of nights a night or two to get used to that um, so it could be good you know you could take something with you whether you can travel with your own pillow for example something that's familiar that if you know you're going to um, if your sleep's going to be affected by something like that you can do something about it and the important thing to remember with our sleep system is we do spend a third of our lives asleep um, so investing in something that is works for you is, is obviously worthwhile. The second thing to consider in a, in a strategy for good sleep is the environment in which you're sleeping in. So we talked about temperature. Your body temperature has a circadian rhythm and it does drop um, throughout the night. Um, so you need, a, you need a cool environment. If you're too hot, your body um, will try and cool you down. Um, and then and then you're staying awake because you're feeling too hot um, so you're better sleeping in an ambient environment about 18 to 20 degrees it's very individualized but most people that's what works for them um, so you could use things like if you've got it air conditioning in the summer and um, to make the room cool before you go to sleep um, actually having a warm bath or shower before you go to bed helps because your body's already on the path to to cooling itself down um, equally not making your room too cold um, so not like my uh, other half did the other night where he left the bathroom window open and we, <laughs> we went to bed it's absolutely freezing in our bedroom so you don't really <laughs> want it to be too cold um, but equally you don't want it to be too hot in there either 
the other thing in terms of your environment is to have a, a calm room so don't have something um, where your bedroom is very busy um, if you know piles of clothes are irritating to you then you know have find something where you know you can have a, have a tidy bedroom before you go to sleep if that's something that's going to annoy you or um, some calming music as you're getting ready to bed you know and then if you need to turn it off or for some people it works to have that playing while they drift off to sleep like I say it's completely individualized even down to the, the paintings that you might have or the pictures you might have in your bedroom the lighting all that kind of stuff the paint that you choose um, some people could be affected by if, the, if it's too bright and too busy. So really just consider that environment and, um, and some of the things that, that you know, work for you in your, in your bedroom. Also some relaxation techniques and, and we'll come on to that in a little bit more detail in a second. But um, just gentle, gentle mindfulness, um, perhaps reading or some uh, gentle music, listening to the radio, providing that they're not a stimulant to you and causing your arousal systems to, to not switch off. So um, use them if they work for you and, and try one thing, don't try them all at once um, and then see how, see what works for you. And, and if it's relaxing to you and helping you, then go for it. The old adage of, of limiting your devices in bed, the people who still do it astounds me but I think in this day and age with COVID it's very hard people you know might be working in their bedrooms and they might actually you know particularly when homeschooling was in the case you know the time to work is in the evening so people are on their tablets on their devices a lot more into the evening um, than they perhaps were and even before COVID um, it was a bit of a problem the, the problem with the tablets and devices is they, is they emit a blue light which is basically telling the melatonin that, that normally would rise with the darkness that it's still light and um, so from a physiological point of view your body doesn't know that it's time to go to sleep because whilst the sleep pressure is rising on the other hand it's saying it's still light it's still light um, and so you get it your brain gets in a bit of a state of confusion um, and so that automaticity to go to sleep doesn't happen quite so easily so Kindles are fine, they don't have the, the blue light and actually on some, <coughs> some phones you can put a night shift mode on so that can help. But ideally, no TV, no tablets, no phones in the bedroom, um, you know, watch whatever you want to watch downstairs before bed and then, you know, 45 minutes, an hour before bed, you know, take off all the devices and start that strategy of calming relaxation before you go to sleep. If you live in an area where there's lots of bright lights or lots of noise, um, then perhaps you can use an eye mask if that's something you can tolerate while you're asleep. Some people don't, don't like to wear it, um, but it can help um, in terms of cut out the light and equally earplugs as well. There's, there's various different options um, available. Also plan ahead. Um, so if you want to make some changes, don't suddenly try and do everything tonight you know try and you know do one thing at a time and then you know what works and you're not going to get stressed about it not working just do one thing at a time and make you know part of your strategy of say right okay well i need to make some changes i'm going to aim <coughs> to make changes three out of seven nights this week and then perhaps build to four nights to five nights and then all of a sudden that becomes part of your routine and it's just what you do you know of an evening before you sleep we talked about sleep extension, what it is, it's essentially napping and we know that it improves nighttime sleep. So if you are somebody that likes to nap and can nap, then it's a good thing to do. Um, but obviously it can be quite limiting in terms of taking out chunks of your day. So it depends on your circumstances, but we do know it improves your nighttime sleep and it is a really effective way of regenerating yourself ready for what's coming for the remainder of the day. Um, and it reduces the sleep pressure we talked about with the, the two causes of sleep where it rises throughout the day it just offsets it for a little while before it climbs again before bedtime um, so it just gives you that that boost in the day there's three types of napping prophylactic so if you're anticipating a period of sleep loss so for example if you've got a big uh, project at work coming up and you know you're going to be working long hours then perhaps you want to bank some sleep the week before um, alternatively replacement or compensatory napping so where you've had that busy period and you've lost some sleep you want to make up for it the following week for example 
um, or just appetitive, so on demand, where you just enjoy an app. Um, so you do it for convenience or enjoyment, and it's something that, that you uh, are able to do, um, not necessarily every day, but on a fairly regular basis, and it, and it works for you, and it doesn't impact on your nighttime sleep which comes on to the best time to nap because obviously we won't, don't want to be napping too late in the day because then we're not going to be tired. Our sleep pressure isn't going to have built enough for bedtime. So the best time is completely individualised. It does um, determine to a certain extent about how stable your sleep-wake schedule is. So that routine that we talked about is important. Um, your chronotype, so morning or evening, <coughs> will impact on, on when and how you nap sometimes and how good your sleep was the night before. Also linked in with that is the amount of prior wakefulness. So how long have you been awake? How much of that sleep pressure has been building throughout the day that's gonna allow you to have that nap? How much daytime sleepiness are you experiencing? Um, and then also the circumstances or the opportunity to nap. Um, it just might not be possible for you to do that based on your on your lifestyle and your circumstances and the motivation it, it may be that you know you, it just doesn't work for you or you're, you're not motivated to, to fit it into your day and that's absolutely fine and it might just be something that you know you do on a holiday because that's when you've got the time to do it um, but the point being that it is something that is beneficial to you and if you get the opportunity to do it um, to, to try it in terms of uh, promoting some good sleep particularly at night time in terms of how long to nap for, um, going back to the 90 minute sleep cycle, if you're napping for 10, 20 minutes or up to half an hour, you're still in the, the non-REM phase of sleep, stage one and two, and you're not really going to have too much trouble waking up from those stages of sleep. They're still restorative um, and they will benefit you, <clears throat> but you haven't gone into the real deep stages of sleep yet. Once you tick into an hour long nap, 45 minutes, an hour long nap, you're really into a deep stage of sleep and the, the inertia, the sleep inertia you'll experience in waking up from that is actually quite difficult and you won't really feel the benefit of that nap um, immediately or in the, in the short term to the same extent as you would from a shorter nap. So if you want to have the longer nap, try and make it the 90 minutes because then you've had your full sleep cycle and you'll wake up naturally in a period of transition between sleep cycle one and, and sleep cycle two um, where you're experiencing two or three hour naps that probably um, indicates either illness or um, more of an issue in your nighttime sleep and you don't really want to get into a stage where you're sleeping for multiple hours in the day and then you're going to have a, a, a negative effect on your nighttime sleep just looking then at some other other causes of, of poor sleep and some strategies around that some of you that, that some of you have mentioned ahead of the talk today so I know with some of the treatment options that the steroids can affect your sleep um, and obviously not being an expert on, on the, the, the specific pathways of the steroids um, but certainly if you know they're going to affect your sleep and you can um, offset some of that by the timing of when you take your steroids so could you take them in the morning for example or if they're twice a day once in the morning and then once in the early afternoon so that the half-life of that steroid being in your system um, isn't isn't as strong as it would be if you took it straight before bed for example there are some gentle interventions um, psychological interventions to help poor sleep um, particularly with insomnia, cognitive behavioural therapy is shown to be um, very beneficial um, and something also a psychological technique called acceptance and commitment therapy. Now both of these need specialist input um, and you can get referral from your GP or seek private consultations around that. Um, equally with pain management, the certain psychological techniques may help with pain management and also take advice from your medics in terms of any pharmacological aids um, for, for managing pain. Probably a key one um, as well is, is the menopause. Um, we get lots of questions about dealing with poor sleep as a result of the menopause. Um, essentially it's the, the change in the hormone co concentrations which gives you the, the symptoms of menopause of which there are many and, and that's what gives you the interrupted sleep patterns. The, the problem being with the menopause is that whilst the average age is, is around 51, 52 years of age, the actual onset, the, the premenopausal state um, can be, you know, as early as, as early or mid 40s. 
Um, so really you're looking at potentially a 10 to 12 year window of menopause or premenopausal symptoms which can affect your sleep which in terms of chronic sleep loss is a significant period of time and that's going to have quite a, a, an effect on somebody's lifestyle if they're experiencing poor sleep for that, that length of time. The good news is there's several strategies that we can um, and look at to combat the effects of, of menopause on our sleep. Obviously there's, there's several symptoms from bad moods, anger, um, irritation, hot flushes, bloating, all kinds of things which are going to affect our sleep. However, some of the things we can look at are the nightwear, so making sure it's breathable, it's light, um, you might want to keep an extra set next to the bed and, and um, get changed during the night if, if the hot flushes have been quite significant. <clears throat> Equally, if you're going to do that, I'll try and minimise the time that you're awake. So if you, you know, be the same as nipping to the loo in the night, you know, you get up and get changed as quickly as you can and you'll be more comfortable um, rather than, than being um, in pyjamas soaked in sweat, you're going to be more comfortable to go back to sleep and hopefully that'll help you get back to sleep quicker. Coming back to your sleep system, so look at that. Is it breathable light fabrics that you're using? Um, are, the, are the bed sheets comfortable? Are they not too heavy? Have you changed them in relation to the season? This kind of thing. Um, do you have a spare bed that you could go and sleep in in the night if you've had excessive night sweats, for example? And using some cooling techniques. So when you are experiencing the hot flushes, um, either fan or air con, have a cool bag by the side of the bed, perhaps with some ice cubes, cold flannel, cold drink, um, some ice packs, something that, that helps cool you down in the short term. Uh, if you're able to and you've got access to, to perhaps lying on the bathroom floor if it's nice and cool, but obviously don't stay there all night, um, just uh, cool yourself down and when you're able to get back to bed as quickly as you can. Other techniques you might want to try in terms of nutrition and, and the effect on hot flushes are not eating spicy foods and foods rich in soy can um, can exacerbate the hot flushes in some instances and also avoid eating large meals straight before bed which which is the same for whether you're experiencing menopause menopausal symptoms and their effects on sleep or, or not you know eating a large meal before bedtime is going to affect your sleep no matter what try and maintain a, a regular normal weight um, too and obviously it goes without saying um, no nicotine, caffeine or alcohol before bedtime um, if you are experiencing symptoms of the menopause. But actually you should limit this anyway um, if you're trying to enhance your sleep. And this isn't so with some of these strategies, it sounds like, you know, saying, you know, don't have fun. I mean, obviously, you know, everyone needs to, to have a life. And if, you know, you want to have the old glass of wine and before bed, that's fine. And, um, but just be aware that over the course of the week your, your sleep will be affected particularly if you're taking on board caffeine and alcohol so you know limit that or, or accept that you're going to have a poor night's sleep um, particularly if you've done something to excess um, with wine for example. Um, finally on the menopause um, sometimes accepting that you know it's going to happen nature will take its course but you can manage the symptoms and, um, and having a proactive attitude to it positive attitude to, to how to make some changes and, and sort of accepting the inevitable in the sense that, you know, as women, this is what happens to us. But if things are, are really bad, then obviously there's some medical interventions that, that perhaps might help. Similarly, some of the psychological uh, interventions I mentioned, so cognitive behavioural therapy might help in some of these instances as well. <clears throat> like I said, in general, nutrition, um, avoiding caffeine, um, if you like caffeine, that's fine, um, but perhaps have you know your coffee early in the morning. So take home tips for good sleep. Obviously, think about your your sleep hygiene, your environment, your behaviour before sleep. Have a have a good bedtime routine, a regular bedtime routine. Bed have a regular bedtime that you go to bed. A regular get up time. Seek sunlight as much as you can. That really helps with your body's ability to, to recognize the light cycles and, and the melatonin rise and fall. Um, seek some physical activity, exercise, a walk, and whatever, whatever works for you, um, and preferably in the fresh air as well, that will, will help with going to sleep. Um, avoid coffee, obviously, in excess. Uh, bad news stories, so obviously there's, there's quite a lot in the press at the minute, um, sort of negative stories, COVID being top of the list. 
Um, and if that affects you and, and sets off anxieties before you're trying to get to sleep, <clears throat> try and turn off notifications on your phone um, in terms of the news or don't watch the news in the evening, you know, those kind of things that, that are going to offset any anxieties or worries that you know affect your sleep. Having a nice warm bath before bed, avoiding, avoiding the tablets, avoiding the screen time, like I said. Some relaxation techniques, whether that be CBT or just some general mindfulness. There's lots of apps available, but obviously you don't want to be on an app on your phone doing mindfulness, but they might give you techniques that you can take and uh, do yourself in the bedroom or listening to something on the radio might help. Um, and really trying all the techniques that we've talked about, try one thing at a time and find what works for you. And the absolute last port of call should be going to the doctor and getting a sleeping pill. This really is a short term effect and not really something that I would advocate. Um, the negative effects far outweigh any, any of the positives that, that you would get um, from taking sleeping pills. Um, one of the questions we had was around weaning yourself off sleeping pills. Um, and yes, if possible, but do this with medical guidance. If, if you've been on sleeping pills for a while, the negative effects and the side effects of, of um, coming off them can be quite extreme. So absolutely don't go cold turkey on it um, and absolutely seek medical guidance on a weaning program to take yourself off them. Um, and also with the tips, just try one thing at a time. Sleep's completely individualised. What works for you what improves your sleep for you won't necessarily work for your best friend, for the person that you share the bed with. So it's, it's got to be you considering the strategies that work for you and having a really good awareness of, of your sleep um, and your sleep schedule. Remember that how you cope and respond to poor sleep is up to you and, and it does change throughout your life. So recognise those time points when that might be happening, particularly in the menopause. Um, and like I say, try one thing at a time and, and perhaps aim for just three out of seven nights. And so you don't try and put pressure on yourself and change your schedule for the rest of the week. And um, just if you go, if something's going to stress you out and cause you not to sleep, there's no point. So just be gentle with yourself and um, try one thing and, and work your way through the work week in terms of uh, finding out what works for you and doing it on a consistent basis. Um, and hopefully that will give you some strategies to improve your sleep. So... Thank you for listening. There are some resources available, which I know Alice and Anna will send out. Um, and yeah, good luck with your sleep. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so we've had some questions come in. Um, the first one is, I had my first operation for ovarian cancer in 1999, recurring in 2005. It is a long time ago, but my sleep pattern is still not good. I can't remember the last time I slept the through the night, usually two hours at a maximum. I would like guidance on how to relax and get off to sleep. I've tried the usual things like no computer before bedtime. I do usually read for a while to help me relax. Okay, oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that your sleep's causing you issues still. Obviously two hours sleep a night is, is not gonna be enough, even um, fragment, fragmented bouts of two hours every so often. Um, I would suggest try a couple more of the strategies. If reading works for you, then um, it sounds like some gentle relaxation does does work for you. Um, try that, and and if not, then try seeking maybe some cognitive behavioural therapy, or where they can give you some techniques that might help when you are trying to get to sleep, or when you when you wake up in the night and have trouble getting back to sleep. Um, but I mean, it's hard to say without knowing exactly what it is that wakes you up. If, you, if, you're, if you're waking up through anxiety or if you're waking up, um, you know, because you're too hot or you're waking up because of the noise or whatever it might be. Um, so try and establish what you think it is that's, that's waking you up. Um, if you can't establish that, what is it that's preventing you get back to sleep? Um, and if that is anxiety related, then there are some, um, like I say, some psychological techniques that that might be able to help if if you do struggle getting back to sleep or you can't get to sleep for half an hour or more it's often worth taking yourself to a different room a, a dimly lit room and trying something like reading listening to some relaxation music um, and then going back um, to bed um, so your brain associates bed with the place where you go to sleep not the place where you stress about not being asleep 
Thanks, Sarah. Um, another question. No matter what I do or what is going on in my life for years before ovarian cancer entered my life, and like clockwork, I have had what I call my wakeful hours from 2 or 3 a.m. to 5 or 6 a.m. I didn't really see that pattern in your introduction. Any insights as to why? And is there a strategy for that particular pattern? It's not, well, it, it, like I say, it is, it is a pattern. Um, it's breaking that pattern and it's working out what works for you. Again, it's hard to say without knowing exactly what it is that's waking you up. Um, it sounds like some people do wake up in between sleep cycles. Um, that's perfectly normal um, because you become more aware. Um, so if you were waking up regularly at 2 a.m. and then you went to the toilet and then you could go back to bed and go back to sleep, that's fine. Um, but if you're if you're awake from 2 a.m. till 6 a.m., obviously, then you need to look at some strategies that are going to help you get back to sleep in that time. It, you know, you're, you're going to experience different stages of sleep later on in the night. Um, and it also depends on, on how old you are as well. Um, so it's coming back to some of the strategies we talked about and, and if it's that you're lying awake stressing about not being asleep so again it comes back to the psychological techniques where you could seek some advice um, on CBT for example that might help in terms of get overcoming that that pattern of waking up and not being able to get back to sleep. Thanks Sarah and uh, someone's asked what do you think about sleep monitoring apps that you tuck under your pillow or sheet? Yeah so I get asked about apps all the time and um, I think anything that doesn't attach itself to your body shouldn't really be used but <coughs> it can't be um, particularly reliable if it's not attached to your body and it's just something that you put by the side of the bed. The one thing I would say about um, sleep gadgets, sleep gizmos, whatever it is you're using, is that they have to be validated against something called polysonography, which is the gold standard of measuring sleep. And that's what you do in a sleep lab. You'll have seen everyone with the EEG all over them, the, the electrodes all over their heads and their eyes and everything, measuring brain waves. Obviously, that's not practical um, for real life in a public setting. Um, what you can do if you're using um, a sleep gadget is use it to see if you've made a change. So if you are wanting to use some of these sleep strategies and you know, let's say a gadget's told you you're normally getting six hours sleep and you make some changes and then it tells you you've had seven hours sleep, <clears throat> whether those numbers are correct um, is out for the jury. But the point is it will tell you that you've had a positive change in your sleep. Um, so it's monitoring the change. And that's where I think they, they do have a place because it reinforces um, the positive aspects of, of making a change and that it's working. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Um, another question. Um, I wake at night regularly, fully awake, and can only go back to sleep by getting up and having a cup of tea. Do you have any tips? Yeah, that's fine. If that works for you, um, I would say a hot milky tea, not necessarily a strong caffeinated tea. Um, but like I say, if you can't get back to sleep for half an hour or more, we, we, we typically say get up, go to a dimly lit room and do something relaxing. But if, if getting up in, in the quiet and having a, a, a warm, milky, hot drink, whether it's, it's tea or warm milk, um, helps you, that's fine. Because all it's doing is reducing your, your, your body, then reduces its core body temperature, which is what it needs to do to get back to sleep. So that's fine. If it, and if it works for you, if you're staying up, drinking three cups of tea and still at the kitchen table three hours later, you probably need to address that. But if it works for you and you can get back to sleep, that's fine. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, we've got seven minutes left and um, there is space for more questions. So if anyone's got any questions, do drop them in the Q&A or in the chat and I'll read them out. Um, I was just wondering, how would people access CBT, Sarah, if they wanted to? Would that be through their GP? Yeah, you can um, see if it's available um, through GP referral pathways or it's available through private clinics. Now, that, that's not an option for everybody, um, but it's a common, um, commonly used technique for if people have been diagnosed with insomnia. Um, but even if you haven't got insomnia and you want to try some um, form of relaxation techniques, then um, CBT is one avenue available to you. Um, but I would also suggest looking at the mindfulness apps. Um, obviously don't use the app in the bedroom, but you can take the techniques from the, the mindfulness and, and use them yourself when you're trying to get to sleep. Okay. 
we've had a couple more questions come in. Would you recommend taking melatonin as a sleep aid? Uh, in short, no. <laughs> um, it, it, melatonin is um, it's a naturally occurring hormone, um, and if you are adding to it through the pharmaceutical uh, pharmacological aids, um, it's it's not really a natural um, process of going to sleep in that sense. I would question why you need to do that um, over and above using some more natural strategies. Uh, people have asked me about that in relation to jet lag in the past as well. Um, and with my old hat on working in elite sport, it's something that we did explore in certain circumstances. Um, but it's not something that I would advocate as a as a a, um, a, a, a way of improving sleep. Thanks, Sarah. And um, someone's asked, what do you think about a low dose of something to help sleep, e.g. amitriptyline or similar drug? I can't comment on the specific drugs other than to go back to the message of um, sleeping pills should be the absolute last resort, even at a low dose. Um, they're just basically changing the physiological pathways in your brain to get to sleep. So it's an artificial sleep that you're experiencing. And at the end of the day, you'd only have to wean yourself off them anyway. So, you know, you'd still have to put strategies in place to get to sleep naturally once you'd finished taking the sleeping pills. So I think if you've exhausted all, all other avenues or you're experiencing a particular um dramatic event in your life that is seriously affecting your sleep um but even then you know the, the, there are other other means of, of of trying to get to sleep before going down the, the medical the medicine route okay. and someone said would you suggest herbal sleep tablets uh, uh, things like herbal tea can be good like chamomile tea and things like that um but again, you've got, to, you've got to be careful, sort of, there's the placebo effect of a herbal tea, uh, herbal sleep tablet in the sense that you, you, you feel you're taking something that is going to help you get to sleep. And I can see that. Um, but again, at the end of the day, I would, I would avoid taking any, any form of, of tablet and, um, and try some more natural strategies. Um, someone said, which sleep app would you recommend for the purpose, as, as you said, of determining if your sleep has improved? I don't have a, a particular um, sleep app that I would recommend. There's so many out there. The one thing that I would recommend is that it's linked to something that attaches to your body. Um, I think the ones that you leave on the bedside table or even under your pillow are um, questionable. Okay, right couple more minutes left so any any last minute questions for Sarah um, before we have to say goodbye to her do do get them in oh um, someone's asked what is acceptance and commitment therapy uh, so that is a psychological technique I'm not a psychologist um, I just know that it's a recommended form of technique if you go on to the sleep school the London sleep school on their website and that's the service that they offer. It's a, it's a psychological technique about um, accepting the, the state that you are in. And then once you've so you accept that you perhaps have insomnia and then it's using techniques to overcome that. Um, but I'm, I'm not um, a therapist, a psychological therapist, so I'm, I'm not going to uh, try and explain that one. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Um, Alice, we might be able to drop that into the chat, could we? The um, the website for the sleep school. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, I think some... it's Dr. Guy Meadows, I think, is who runs it. Okay, and someone said thanks. This has been very helpful. Okay. So... <laughs> so, any last minute questions? Um, we can probably squeeze maybe one more in um, before. Oh, uh, oh, and Alice, thank you, has put the um, the website for the sleep school in, um, so um, so you can have a look at that if um, if acceptance and commitment therapy is something that you're interested in. And as Sarah said at the beginning, uh, we will circulate the um, links and resources that um, that Sarah's passed on to us, um, which will be which will be useful follow up after this.